thank you very much uh, dr prakash for giving uh, giving a very nice uh, introduction about me and i welcome uh, all the audience and i wish them all a very uh, good evening uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your time uh, with us uh, for this presentation uh, by looking at the audience uh, i found that more than uh, Uh, 50 percentage of you, uh, around half of you, are, uh, undergraduate students. So I have structured my talk in such a way that, that uh, I, would, I would give a very conceptual uh, introduction about NGS approaches in the beginning, and then later on would move towards the uh, towards idea of uh, uh, how to uh, combat infectious diseases by means of uh, NGS approaches. I'd like to start my uh, talk with uh, a very uh, interesting and uh, inspiring quote by Thomas Huxley. Uh, he tried to give a definition for uh, an educated person. He said that an educated person should know something about everything and everything about something. Right? This is uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Huxley. Right? Uh, he was a He was a comparative anatomist and physiologist. Why am I saying this here? Uh, that's uh, something very important. See, uh, more and more uh, science and technology today are becoming uh, interdisciplinary. So it's important to know about uh, several fields uh, to, pro to produce uh, an excellent technology or to do uh, very uh, interesting things. and exciting science uh, it's important to know several different things particularly uh, uh, bioinformatics and uh, very particularly ngs methods uh, you need to know several things like for example uh, in ngs uh, you need to know uh, you need to be very good in statistics very good in scripting programming computer science should be good in chemistry as well physics chemistry physics material science material science is necessary because uh, the platforms for uh, ngs experiments have to be fabricated uh, there are several properties that uh, those platforms should have in order to perform the experiment in a very successful manner so all these things are important and of, and of course for ngs a very strong uh, base in biology is important because it's the biological question that we are trying to answer so several kinds of these disciplines comes together and you have a very wonderful technology like ngs right so that is why i i start um, my talk by uh, this uh, very nice quote by huxley try to learn something about everything and everything about something i always start my talk with uh, professor g n ramachandran in the middle because uh, i uh, i come from the department uh, that he started and i'm really proud of that Uh, from university of madras and there is uh, there are other two reasons why i start uh, apart from that there are other two reasons why i start uh, with uh, this particular slide you see here uh, this is uh, linus pauling who gave the structure of uh, alpha helix a model for alpha helix uh, second structure in protein and this uh, you might all be very familiar with this is uh, watson and crick uh, with their uh, famous double helical model for dna and this is uh, professor g n ramachandran who gave a, a triple helical model for collagen so a single helix a double helix and a triple helix all these three helices of life give us a very useful insight in fact we can call these discoveries as a starting point of modern biology modern molecular biology why do i say that because you see these three people showed us that important biological macromolecules can be visualized they gave a molecular picture for life these molecules how to visualize these molecules that's what they gave and that is very important knowing the structure of uh, molecules immediately uh, tell something about the function say take as an example this double helical structure of uh, dna once you look at the structure immediately after uh, after uh, modeling the structure by x-ray diffraction techniques we were able to see they were, they were able to see the base pairing right 
once the idea of base pairing comes inside immediately we can say we, we are able to understand or we are able to give a theory about how the dna replicates how the dna transcribes translates all these things isn't it so the entire idea of base pairing came from this structure from this structure with the idea of base pairing immediately its implications was uh, people were able to explain how dna replicates people were able to explain how it transcribes translates there were several experiments that depend on this almost entire molecular biology depends on this base pairing mechanism isn't it or pcr even the ngs experiments that we do all of them depend on the base pairing mechanism of the bases in the dna so that's why structures are important you understand the structure you are able to understand the function and it could give rise to several new technologies right so that is one reason why i start with this particular slide uh, second reason is you see while these structures are solved several observations were made several calculations were done several measurements were made several calculations were done several computations were done of course they didn't have computers at those time but they did those computations manually right so these discoveries not only gave a molecular picture for life but also underlined that there is a computational demand for biology for chemistry for biology right so that is why i like to start my talk with this it gives us a molecular picture as well as it tells us that there is a computational demand for uh, biology in the future right with that i would like to i would like to take you through a very brief history of bioinformatics i wouldn't spend much time in this but why do i say this why do i have to include these slides when i finish this uh, brief history of bioinformatics you will be able to understand why i have introduced but why why am i trying to talk about these things right as i as i start, as i said uh, uh, the alpha helix model by linus pauling was the starting point uh, of uh, modern molecular biology followed by that batson and creek they proposed a double helical model for dna in 1953 and the sequence of uh, bovine insulin was first sequenced by frederick sanger 1955 so protein sequence the protein bovine insulin was sequenced by sanger 1955 itself right only after all these things the first integrated circuit of the ic chip was fabricated by texas instruments in 1958 before that it was all vacuum tubes and uh, very very large ele uh, electronic system right so my uh, integrated chips by 1958 and see by 1965 there was a rudimentary uh, database like structure atlas of protein sequence and structures so this uh, see uh, at that time there were only very few sequences but the people like margaret dev understood that these uh, sequences has to be collected has to be uh, there has to be some kind of repository where these sequences can be deposited as well as uh, used by others uh, to come to meaningful conclusion and the ne next discovery is even more beautiful you see in 1970 uh, we have the noodle needle man and unch algorithm for sequence comparison there are, at that time there were only a few hundred not even a few hundred sequences just a hundred sequences or so but there was an algorithm developed to compare those sequences similarly you see by 1970 Unix operating system by uh, AT&T Bell Labs were developed, and then uh, protein sequence database by once again by Margaret Dev, a uh, regular full-fledged database uh, by 1972, right? And by 1977, Sanger developed DNA sequencing methodology. You will see more about this Sanger sequencing. And by 1986, you see the term genomics was coined by Thomas Rodrick. genomics is not a new term it was coined by uh, as early as 1986 in fact there was a journal uh, called genomics for which uh, thomas rodrick was uh, the editor so human genome initiative announced by uh, doe 1986 pearl language 1987 and the ncbi the center not the website the center 
by 1987 fasta and blast algorithm blast program and fasta algorithms fasta programs also 1988 and 1990 so you see these programs as well as uh, this uh, uh, bioinformatics data methodologies everything was developed and only after all these things were developed the name bioinformatics was coined somewhere around 1991 right now you have everything you have the data you have the data analytic methods by data i primarily mean uh, uh, there were some, several structures as well so sequences and structures right so i primarily mean them uh, so this data has to be taken towards a more general audience more more scientists biologists right so at that time exactly we had the internet so the world wide web in fact it is a service over the internet but um, these protocols http and html protocols uh, html language http protocols were developed in crn by 1991 so the internet was ready to take all these uh, uh, all these uh, data and uh, application tools that are developed by both by biologists and computer scientists together so it could reach with the help of internet it could reach uh, many people right so human genome systems and uh, tiger by craig venter later on craig venter found the cellular genomics which was part of uh, uh, finding the draft human genome so by 1992 and um, you see more data accumulated and exactly at that time we had a beautiful language called java released by uh, sun microsystems and netscape uh, released the uh, javascript version 1 and then by 1998 we had uh, the human influenza genome and c elegans genome uh, sequence and 2001 the first draft of human genome was sequenced now you see this human genome sequencing the first draft came by sanger sequencing method all right not ngs methods however we had the uh, sequence by 2001 and the rest is history all right so why why am i talking all these things you see i have marked uh, the discoveries and inventions in biology in uh, in, in maroon color and the dis- uh, the inventions discoveries and tools in uh, computer science in uh, blue color you see it almost fits neatly by like a like a zigzag puzzle isn't it so whenever there is an invention in biology uh, there is another something else comes from computer science that uh, that 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 helps uh, the biological inventions to progress further and whenever there is a computer science invention then there is biological data to be analyzed and to be uh, validated right so The, the the combination of uh, inventions and discoveries in biology as well as in computer science they came together to something like this right so that is why i am giving you a set of slides to emphasize the importance of taking a knowledge from some other discipline to our discipline would uh, lead us to something wonderful like this or even more so that is what i want to emphasize by uh, showing this set of slides all right so uh, this slide shows the advancement in uh, com- uh, the field of computation all right it's not just biology which had a very fast growth in the past 5 or 6 decades see this was the first uh, uh, computer in 1940s it was not even called as a computer it was called as an electrical numerical integrated computer and uh, So look at the huge size it's not this one is not the computer the entire room is a computer connected everything right but now you see you have a very neat uh, for example a mac air book which can be um, put inside a paper and well very comfortably in fact the mobile phones that you have are much much more powerful than uh, the computers uh, that, that are uh, a computer like this right all right so coming to the main topic Uh, in order to understand uh, next generation sequencing procedure it is very important for you to know uh, sanger sequencing method most of you might know but uh, i'll i'll just go go through that once again 
So what do we do in a Sanger sequencing procedure? You have a strand that has to be sequenced, a piece of DNA that has to be sequenced and then uh, what do we do? We attach a radio label primer, right, which could, uh, which could go on base pair here and then what else do we do? We do uh, we put all uh, DNTPs and then we also add in four different tubes for dideoxynucleotides. By controlling the concentration, the ratio of these DNTPs and uh, DDNTP, it's possible to allow the strand stop, terminate in such a way that at every base there are some strands that terminate, right? So they are all going to uh, differ in their molecular weight. So by running them through uh, gel electrophoresis, it's possible by looking at the bands and interpreting the signals right? because it's already radio label, right? So it's the radio signal. Radio, uh, uh, so the signal comes from the radioactive elements, right? So by that, it's possible to read. So that is the basis of uh, Sanger sequencing method. In fact, um, most of the NGS methods depend on this. These type of sequences are, uh, are known as uh, uh, sequencing by synthesis procedure, right? So, since a new strand is synthesized, since a new strand is synthesized here and uh, they are terminated uh, at appropriate places, we get this. So, it is called as uh, sequencing by synthesis, right? Nowadays, Sanger sequencing method has improved no more radioactive probes. What we do is we have uh, fluorescently labeled nucleotides. Nevertheless, the principle is the same. So, you have the strand and as uh, these fluorescently labeled dideoxynucleotides go and attach, it terminates at uh, all. You, have, you can adjust, as I told you before, you can adjust the concentration such a way that you will have uh, a few strands that terminates at every one of these bases. So, every one of these bases will form uh, a fragment uh, in which it has terminated to. So, you have several different fragments, run them through capillary electrophoresis, they all emit fluorescence which could be red and that is what you get as a signal and based on the color you can say which uh, base it is, alright. So, uh, G is yellow color fluorescent, then it is G, A is green color fluorescent. So, based on the signal you assign the base. This procedure is called as base calling. Right, so you have the signal based on the signal, you assign a base to a particular position, it is known as base calling. Right, so that's what uh, I have given here. So, accurate base calls, and uh, this was the choice of uh, Sanger sequencing, is a very accurate method, even now. All right, so this, uh, this, this was uh, the choice of human genome project, however, you see that it cannot achieve high throughput. Uh, see, uh, whatever say, sequencing procedure you do, the human genome is too big to sequence that entirely at a stretch. It is very, very difficult and you need high throughput procedures to do the sequencing. At most, uh, you can only sequence a few uh, hundred bases, a few hundred bases at a time, uh, 600, 700 maximum, maximum. Normally, on an average, it is 200, 300, right? So, See, where is 300, 400 and what is the size of the genome? So many bases, isn't it? So, you need something that is high throughput, that is massively parallel and uh, in order to sequence an, uh, a genome at a reasonable time and at a, a reasonable cost as well. So, what do we do? We need some methods like, uh, like NGS which should uh, describe later on. You see here, what is the difference between this NGS method and this type of Sanger sequencing method, all right? So that is what I would uh, like to emphasize first. You see, this Sanger sequencing method has two primary steps, I say three here, but these two can be combined into a single step. So one is a step for synthesis or a polymerization step and the other one is a detection step. So any sequencing method that has these two steps are known as the first generation sequencing method. So, how is the NGS method different? Any sequencing procedure that 
combines these two steps there are no uh, synthesis step and a detection step combine both of them then those type of sequencing methods are known as next generation sequencing methods there are many uh, so what uh, what what does it uh, how do you achieve that see while doing a sanger sequencing method the chain is terminated instead of terminating if you allow the chain to grow and as a, when the new nucleotide goes and adds if it could emit the signal and keeps on going without terminating then it becomes a next generation sequencing method and that becomes high throughput as well because you don't need to bother about too many uh, chain terminated fragments so one fragment its synthesis its corresponding sequence would be obtained as signals right so that is how ngs technologies differ from the first generation sequencing methodology they do not permanently terminate the growing chain so that the synthesis can be monitored as each and every base is incorporated so what does it do it allows sequencing of millions of dna fragments simultaneously and by that it helps us to achieve high throughput so there are several uh, methodologies uh, that are given here you see in the beginning of my talk i told you that um, uh, so i will i will keep my talk with a conceptual introduction but my slides might have a little bit more detail and i will be sharing my slides so anybody who wants uh, uh, some more detailed uh, information could go through my slides all right so there are different types of uh, nds methods illumina antaran smrt are the most popular one and we we'll see what they do so what 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 does an nds experimental experimental workflow looks like you have the target dna let us say a genome too huge too complex to be you cannot sequence the entire genome at a single stretch so what we have to do is we have to fragment that we have to make chop them into random pieces of different length no problem random pieces of small 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 lengths so there will be a few million pieces that comes from the dna so few million fragments and out of that we can make a size selection right and then add adapters to that so these adapters are to immobilize uh, the uh, fragments that are to be sequenced so they are immobilized on a platform and then sequencing procedure starts with the help of uh, polymerase enzyme so sequencing goes on and as i told you as and when new bases come and add it emits a signal and it continuously grows there is no termination process here so what do we have in the end we have a set of sequence uh, for the fragments right so there are few million fragments here and at the output is the sequence of all these few million fragments so what is the logical next step to put them all together so that we reconstruct the entire genome how is that reconstruction done since this is all random we are going to have overlapping fragments see for the sake of convenience of the presentation i gave i give here a few uh, six or seven bases here but you have to understand that these fragments are all a few hundred uh, bases right say for example 300 bases so what you are going to have is a set of overlapping fragments and their corresponding sequences since there are overlap they all could be aligned together right so you align them together you get you, you are actually going to get an assembled uh, genome right quite often if the sequences of the organism that we are sequencing is already known a reference genome for that will be available for example you are sequencing uh, Uh, sequencing the genome of uh, say cancer patient uh, reference human genome is already available you can take that also into consideration during the alignment so that it will give several meaningful insights right so that is the alignment procedure that is why bioinformatics becomes very important here until this experiment once you get the data there are too much bioinformatics to be done too much computation to be done 
So you have to put all of them together and then you reconstruct the sequence of the genome. That is what we call alignment of the sequenced reads. So what do you mean by reads? The sequence of these fragments, of these fragments, each one of the fragments, the, the technical term is known as a read once it is sequenced, right? Okay. So now what, there is something else that I want you to understand. You see, for example, you have an A here. Let us consider this as a reference, you know, and uh, there is an A here. And this A is also covered by four fragments. So the coverage at this particular position is 4x. Similarly here, 4x. Here, 2x. What it means is this particular T that we have derived or that is present in the reference genome has two fragments supporting that. Alright. So here it is 2x. Uh, here there will be many but uh, we will just consider this because we are going to have million few million reads everywhere there will be fragments but just consider a small scenario like this all right so 4x here 4x here 4x here 2x here 3x here 4x once again here sometimes there could be mismatches we'll come to that later on all right but you see we can make an average then. 4x 4x for every position there is a coverage and we can make an average of coverage for all these positions and that would be the coverage of your sequenced data. So quite often in NGS uh, uh, data, you s uh, people used to say, I have a, uh, achieved a coverage of 100x, I have achieved a coverage of 50x, things like that. It means that on an average, every position has so many number of bases representing that particular position, so many number of reads representing that particular position. That's what we mean by coverage number. Okay. So, uh, you can go through this. Uh, I have explained the same things uh, in these uh, slides. So, what is the output? That is what is important here. Right? The output normally from the machine comes out as a FASTQ file. We call it as a FASTQ format file. The second thing what I want you to remember is for the sake of convenience, I said uh, synthesis in one direction, but it could be in two directions as well, in either directions. So, such kind of uh, uh, sequencing procedures are known as paired end sequencing procedures. So, it could be paired end as well. So, that is what I want you to understand. And as I told you before, NGS is an interdisciplinary approach. It brings together high performance computing advancement that is necessary because you see I told you there are millions of fragments here and so you are going to have millions of strings that has to be put together and reconstructed. You know. Apart from that you will need to under, understand the quality of the there are several statistics that has to be done here and so you need a, there is a very high demand for uh, high performance computing and then advancements in microfabrication as I told you before because you have to develop the platform, signal detection, optics, microscopy, imaging techniques, semiconductor, nanotechnology, etc. Right. We would see, before going further, we would see uh, some of the uh, popular uh, sequencing uh, technologies, NGS sequencing technologies that are available. The most popular one is this uh, Illumina reversible die terminator sequencing. This is the Illumina machine. IC3000 system. What does it do? You have a set of uh, uh, flow cells, right? So this is called as a flow cell. This is where you load uh, the uh, uh, fragment DNAs, and this is a schematic picture. Uh, what happens is you see a very small area is enlarged, and even among that, another small area is enlarged. All these tiny dots or tiny fragments of uh, DNA that are uh, immobilized here, right? So what happens is there are different uh, fluorescent uh, probes, uh, sorry, fluorescent nucleotides, each one of them uh, having their own uh, colors. For example, A is green, T is yellow, G is uh, uh, red, right? So what happens is as and when the nucleotides go and add, it is going to emit color. And as I told you before, it is not going to terminate the growth. So you are going to have continuous uh, color emissions as the respective nucleotides go and add uh, uh, to the growing chain. 
right so you see so what happens here is each one of these tiny dots are different fragments they are not going to have the same sequence because they come from different organs and everything is randomly fragmented so you have so many fragments and this enlargement you see the cycle one of addition this particular dot represents one particular fragment similarly this particular dot represents this particular dot represents some other fragment similarly all right so this fragment at that particular cycle a g is added so it emits the red fluorescence In cycle 2 a T is added, so it emits a yellow fluorescence. Cycle 3, some other C is added because of uh, the color. See, every other fragments also, the colors change. All right. So what happens is, we can have a detector which can actually take a movie of the change in color from which the addition of nucleotides could be uh, interpreted uh, later on from the signals that is being uh, emitted and what is more important uh, is you have to uh, look at the uh, look at the size and scale of this experiment you see it's so tiny within that some other environment and within this you have about 10 fragments 10 different fragments not the same fragments 10 different fragments so the sequencing is done on such a massive scale so that is what i i want to underline here Right. So, after all these things, the sequence can be interpreted and then you have a set of uh, set of reads and the corresponding sequences. The next important procedure is uh, the ion torrent uh, semiconductor sequencing uh, technology. So, here in Illumina, what we had was uh, uh, the detection was based on fluorescence, but in ion torrent, you see, whenever a new nucleotide goes and adds to a growing strand it changes the ph of uh, the micro environment there and that ph could be detected by means of uh, um, by, by means uh, the ph uh, change in the micro environment could be detected and that could be the signal here so in the illumina it was the fluorescence that acted as a signal and in um, ion torrent it is the ph change uh, that acts as a signal so this is the ion torrent uh, sequencing machine and the third uh, important uh, technology is uh, the single molecule real time sequencing technology uh, what it does uh, is uh, you have a nano pool where uh, dna polymerase and uh, the synthesis machinery are immobilized and the dna strand that is to be sequenced moves through that so it's not the polymerase that moves it's a strand that moves through that and as and when it moves as new nucleotides come and add uh, the signal fluorescent signal is going to be emitted and for every pore there could be a detector that detects so there are many pores many fragment goes through uh, many fragment of dna goes through this and they get sequence so the advantage of uh, this uh, kind of single molecule real time sequencing is uh, they they could uh, this is also called the nanopore sequencing procedure uh, see, uh, the, the, a very large uh, fragment of DNA could be sequenced by means of this. And uh, however, they have major disadvantages like uh, high error rate and run cost. But it is an advancing technology, and we expect uh, this technology to improve further in in the coming days. Now, these are the set of uh, uh, three more popular sequencing. Uh, technologies that I have discussed. Apart from this, there are other technologies like uh, solid and pyro sequencing. Those technologies have become obsolete now. So I didn't uh, discuss them, but uh, the information about them are available uh, in the slides as well as uh, elsewhere. So after, uh, after getting the sequence, after getting the reads, what we have to do is there are several set of data analytic procedures that has to be followed right so you see NGS uh, has several kinds of applications whatever uh, the application is it has these three steps that are common so the base calling procedure the quality control and pre-processing procedure and the 
uh, read mappings uh, to the reference genome that is the alignment to the reference genome quite often uh, this is what happened but sometimes uh, see uh, completely new um, uh, completely uh, new genome could be sequenced uh, an, an organism whose sequence is not known earlier could be sequenced such type of uh, sequencing is not uh, allowed to do a de novo sequencing and a de novo genome assembly right so for, you see if you look at the ngs experiments most often the sequencing is done for uh, if you look at any database you would see that most often the sequencing is done for uh, and for organisms whose sequences are already known and the reference genome is available but uh, in rare cases it's possible that a new organisms uh, you know uh, could be sequenced you go for a de novo genome sequencing assembly right so what do you mean by base calling i have already explained that uh, uh, depending on the signal assigning a base to a particular position uh, in the dna is known as a base calling procedure but there is something more to it what it means is you see here i told you that uh, by uh, but the signal is actually say for example it's a fluorescent signal right so you have a fluorescent signal it's all right you have an yellow fluorescence and you assign a g here but it's also important that there could be a quantitative representation since fluorescence the amount of fluorescence could be measured so g all right because of the yellow color but how confident are you about this g that could be given by the quantity Uh, quantitative uh, uh, quant quantity of fluorescence assigned uh, along with it so the uh, amount of fluorescence could be measured and so it's not only a, a, a qualitative measurement it is also a quantitative measurement so what we have in base calling is the base and a base calling score associated with that which says how confident are you about that particular base calling instinct so this data comes from the sequencing experiment itself you don't have to do anything about them but if you could understand but uh, you should have an understanding of uh, what is the procedure and how you get the quality scores followed by this you have a few million reads each of the reads having corresponding bases associated and uh, associated uh, quality scores followed by that you'll have to do a data quality control and pre processing i had explain what they are in the coming slides followed by that you'll have to do uh, an alignment procedure why you should do an alignment that i explained before all right how you to how, how to do that you we'll see that in, in the coming slides once this is done there are several applications for Uh, NGS uh, technology. All right. So this is what I explained by base calling a quality score. So you see, I already told you that the output of uh, an NGS uh, experiment, uh, you have data uh, of the sequences in a fast queue format file. So what is that fast queue format file? It contains uh, four lines. Every read is described by four lines. the first and the third line or remark line you can just leave them the second line is the actual sequence of bases and the fourth line is a sig uh, signal quality so this is the quality score for the corresponding base so it is given in ascii characters so any any uh, any key that you type in your computer uh, is converted to a number and that is what goes inside as an input to the computer so that uh, for example b represents uh, 67 a represents 66 and it goes on like that so that uh, that is a that is that is a uh, called as ascii value so every key that you type in your keyboard has an ascii value associated to that ascii stands for american standard code for information and interchange that is a standard throughout the world and that is what is followed here so basically what you have in a fast queue file is the base its corresponding quality score so this is a number right but it is described 
and ASCII format that's all. So a base and its corresponding score. Base and its corresponding score. So it goes on like that. Right? So that is the first queue form. Like this, there will be millions. So this is for one read. Like this, there will be millions of reads in a single text file. So that is what you will have to process. So how do we do the quality control? Once you have this first queue file, what you're supposed to do is the quality control of that. We do it by means of a, a toolkit called FastQC. Right? I, I want you to concentrate more on this. Um, these are freely available uh, toolkits. Right? I'll, 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 I'll tell uh, in, during the progress of my talk, I'll give you information about uh, more information about the different tools that could be used to analyze uh, NGS data and where to get the data from. All right? So, you see, FastQC is a very easy toolkit which can be downloaded and installed in your computer or in there are other uh, 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 cloud-based uh, uh, servers that could help you access this uh, toolkit. Right? I'll, I'll explain that in, in the coming slides. So they have a very easy user interface where you give in the data and very easily uh, it could give the quality of the scores. You see green color, good quality. So this is a good quality data. The box plots lie in the green color, good quality data. But see, this is a bad quality data where most of the uh, the mean and the median as well goes below, right? not in the green color. So it's a poor quality data. There are other metrics as well, like very simple metrics. What is important is, you see, this uh, apart from the quality scores, it's possible that the uh, reads that you have have some over-represented and artificial sequences. Normally, these artificial sequences are over-represented as well. What happens is you have a set of uh, uh, adapters and PCR primers that could be duplicated sequences. We use them adapters, PCR primers while doing our sequencing, isn't it? So those could also be sequenced and they could be mixed in your data. It's important to identify them and to remove them. So this fast QC uh, like tools uh, point us to these type of sequences, overrepresented sequences. Quite often some of the overrepresented sequences, these adapters is something that we already know the sequence of. Right? Sometimes it's possible to identify this type of overrepresented sequences by means of KML statistics. Right? So in short, what it does is fast QC like tools. Apart from giving us the quality of the scores and giving us an idea about the quality of the data, that also helps us to say how much of these artificial overrepresented sequences which do not belong there are present here. So once this has been identified, they have to be removed from the data set and this could be done by means of uh, softwares like uh, NGS Short, SQL, Primomatic, FastX Toolkit, NGS QC Toolkit, there are many softwares that could do this. Right? So similarly, FastQC is a quality control tool. Apart from that, there are FastX Toolkits, NGS QC Toolkits, which could do the same. All right. So once it is done, once the trimming is done, you have removed all the uh, all the overrepresented sequences and you have the data properly, good quality data, you will have to go for alignment. Right? Alignment is nothing but you put all the reads together and re try to reconstruct the entire uh, genome. And it's quite often helpful to have a reference genome. Most of the cases you will have the reference genome. So you consider the reference genome as well uh, to, to do the alignment. There are, I'm not going into the details of the algorithm itself. But there are two different uh, types of two different ways by which you can align. One is called as a space seed uh, alignment, and the other one is a burrow wheeler alignment. Burrow wheeler alignment is the more popular and more successful uh, one. Uh, burrow wheeler alignment is basically um, uh, the, the zip files that we create uh, uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, reducing the size of the files follows this burrow wheeler algorithm. Right? Basically, the size is huge, so you uh, do a borrow transformation and then do an alignment 
uh, based on that right so what is important is you just remember these tools so mac elang novaline they do space seed alignment and uh, bote and soap to bote is the more popular tool so to do the burrow villa alignment all right you just understand this as we progress further i tell you where to get this so once this is done what do we have as an output that is important this is something that you need to understand so we started with uh, fast queue format file and then you did an alignment and now after alignment you would get a sam or bam format file it's called a sequence alignment map right so this is how uh, uh, sam file looks like you don't have to try to interpret all these things this is for the computer to read just understand that uh, sam file is an output of the alignment procedure quite often it is in binary so it is called the binary uh, compressed version right so since the computer is going to read it's fine you can have them as a uh, binary file all right so there are several parameters uh, several uh, fields in this uh, uh, sam uh, alignment uh, format uh, you can go through all of them what is important is this uh, concise uh, it's called as a cigar string it's a concise uh, idiosyncratic genomic alignment report or alignment read in some cases they call it so that is very uh, important that tells us the nature uh, of the alignment with the reference you know what it simply means is that it's just a simple code you see here for example it says this is the cigar uh, cigar uh, score sorry cigar uh, field value so 8m means 8 matches that read match, makes 8 matches with the reference you know two insertions once again followed by four matches one deletion and three matches so that is what uh, a concise way of defining the alignment right how do we manipulate or how do we work with these sam files there are many uh, sam tools and picard all right sam uh, what we can do is uh, different rates with uh, you can associate genomic coordinates also along with that that would become a pile up uh, file or a pilot format file all right so different applications of uh, ngs technologies what you can do is uh, you can you can isolate the mrna alone and then try to sequence them and what you have is set of expressed regions expressed regions and how much uh, the amount of expression uh, of a particular gene as well so such type of methodologies are known as rna seq methodologies basically they try to do what microarray experiments did uh, at, at about a decade uh, ago right but there is a, uh, there is a difference between micro experiment microarray experiment and an rna seq experiment in an rna seq experiment it's possible to detect uh, novel uh, genes which uh, microarray experiments cannot and novel splice variants can also be efficiently detected by rna seq methodologies which cannot be done by microarray experiment so rna seq is an experiment that tells that allows us to profile the expressed uh, genes and the corresponding expression levels qualitative as well as quantitative as well and then it's also possible to identify spliced variants uh, in uh, the particular gene so basically transcriptomic profiling and splice variant detection is done by means of rna seq experiment similarly it's possible to identify polymorphism variation variations associated with different physical traits with different diseases you can talk about disease predisposition in individuals drug responses etc so that will lead us to personalized medicine similarly de novo genome assembly i have already told you that uh, it's possible to by means of ngs experiments it's possible to sequence the genome uh, of an organism for which uh, the sequence genome is not available before all right so de novo genome sequencing but you have to understand that since uh, reference genome is not available it's uh, you need to have a very high quality data to do this de novo genome sequencing assembly and the chip seq methodology is also very interesting application of uh, ngs what it tries to do is it tries to identify this methodology tries to identify uh, the regions in the genome which can bind to proteins that region alone could be sequenced 
it is done by means of uh, immunoprecipitation procedures immunochemistry so you can precipitate that region alone then do a sequencing you get the sequences of region where dna binds to proteins right so that region alone could be sequence and that will give us an idea about protein dna interaction and the corresponding analysis that is done by chip seq methodology similarly epigenomics dna methylation studies the epigenomic factors or uh, factors inheritable uh, factors that can introduce some traits whereas uh, that inheritable trend is not because of uh, uh, the change in basis so that is what we mean by epigenomics they are inheritable but you cannot attribute that inheritable trend to uh, dna basis let's right? say for example some regions could be methylated that could be inherited and mm, that could uh, give rise uh, to inheritable traits those kind of regions alone can be identified by means of methyl seq experiments so these type of experiments try to say for example this experiments methyl seq experiments have demonstrated how monozygotic twins display differences in certain phenotypes how uh, epigenomic profiles can lead to uh, certain diseases like uh, some types of cancers the next important application of uh, ngs technology is metagenomics uh, metagenomics is a study of uh, uh, community of uh, unculturable say uh, microbial species say for example if you have a microbium human microbium uh, sorry gut human gut microbium and uh, what what you can do is see most of those uh, microbes cannot be cultured what you can do is take a take take a sample of uh, uh, human uh, fluid from uh, human micro uh, human gut and directly sequence uh, the dna present there so what what you have is you are not doing any culturing here so it is uncultured but uh, the genome sequence that you have is not that of one particular organism but it's the genome of an entire community right so this type of metagenomics processing uh, the advantage is ngs method is very quick and uh, the sequencing is cheap and you have the sequence of these kind of microbial communities but the disadvantages are uh, uh, they are often more complicated data right since it's not a single genome the data is going to be more complicated and uh, since they are uh, mostly non redundant all right uh, aligning them would be a problem and then they cause uh, lesser coverage because of uh, lesser uh, uh, alignment aligned regions right uh, the use of paired in ta tags and uh, use of uh, graft theory methods uh, help us overcome this type of uh, disadvantages all right so these are set of uh, applications where we can apply this ngs technology uh, successfully uh, has been demonstrated in these areas what i do now is i'll tell you uh, some uh, freely available uh, websites freely available websites and tools that would allow you to download this data and do the analysis for yourself these websites and these toolkits are completely free and they are all open source and you don't need any hi-fi computers to do this type of analysis all uh, you need to have is a laptop and you can go to these uh, uh, repositories download the data and then you can do uh, data analysis by yourself so while doing that you would be learning several things right so that is the idea here so sra is uh, the repository it's called as uh, sequence read archive where uh, all the data of ngs experiments are deposited all right so what you do is you go to this ncbi uh, just type in google you just type ncbi and ncbi will have several uh, databases and several tools what you have to do is you have to click this and then you have to uh, select this sra so once you have this sra you can just type some uh, simple Uh, text search right so here i have typed as gut metagenome what you'll see is you'll have the data about all the experiments that has been performed in uh, gut uh, metagenome all you have to do is just click these uh, links you directly get uh, the data data in fastq format 
all right you just have to download it so there are several ways by which you can narrow down so you want you are interested only human get meta genome just click this there are so many so many uh, data entries so far all right or you just click this if you want mouse meta genome all just in a, within a few clicks you will be able to get uh, different uh, you will be able to get uh, the data from different experiments the next this is the most important uh, uh, most important um, application this is a cloud application completely free all you have to do is just type uh, go to this website and then uh, what you have to do is you have to create a, a, a login for yourself that's all right so it's completely free it gives you a space for cloud access so this is called as a galaxy cloud and once you have your own access you are going to access this through a browser in your laptop and you have access to all different ngs tools all right so what you do is see there is a there is a functionality called get data here all you have to do is click this once you log in you will have to do is click this get data and then you can give this accession numbers that you have identified here so this is the accession number for this particular data so you don't even have to download the data in your computer so you get data give that accession number and you just click okay that data gets transferred directly to your cloud space and then you have all set of data analysis tools you have tools for quality control you have tools for uh, 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 deep tools, tools for mapping, tools for RNA seq analysis, SAM tools, BAM tools, SNP effect, whatever. All right, so all these tools are available here, and they are free for you, open source, and within a few clicks, you don't have to bother about downloading them, installing them. So you don't have to bother about the computational uh, knowledge that uh, uh, that uh, that is necessary. right to install them you don't need a linux computer to do this works all you need is a laptop and all you need is a browser in that laptop get the user access that is also completely free and the data is also free all you have to do is within a set, small set of clicks it's possible to uh, do the analysis and there are several tutorials this tutorial is a 2017 tutorial the videos of these tutorials are available in this you can just google and find apart from these there are several tutorials that uh, that tells you how to easily do these data analysis so you see you don't have to bother as i told you about downloading or maintaining the program or installing all you can do is within a few clicks you can complete the data analysis and you can bother about the actual biological costing that you are thinking about so using this galaxy would uh, make things very simple some of these tools might be outdated but uh, for learning i think uh, this uh, uh, this galaxy tool is uh, more than sufficient right so i i i i, I suggest all of you to uh, have, have a Uh, look and go through uh, this uh, set of tools all right so now we come to the next part of my talk how do i relate this to infectious diseases and how the data the scale of the data analysis all these things see while introducing the history of uh, bioinformatics i have all, always insisted that whatever technology that has been developed in computer science has been used to by biologists to create something something great something new something uh, some some excellent discovery isn't it i showed you examples of that now big data analytics and the corresponding uh, software uh, platforms developed by computer scientists and uh, computer technologies uh, is quite often uh, used or more used in uh, in uh, marketing in uh, several other uh, uh, several several other applications right so big data analytics and big data is uh, is is the 
uh, is currently the trend in uh, computer science so into the we are living in uh, the era of uh, information isn't it so more and more information is being uh, gathered more and more data is being gathered that has to be efficiently used so big data analytics big data technology uh, comes uh, in uh, offering uh, easy solutions for analyzing those type of big data so if you ask any computer scientist he would say that or any computer person he would say that uh, big data are characterized by four b's the volume the volume the velocity the variety and veracity so these are the characteristics of a big data right so based on these several uh, uh, several beautiful uh, computer application oriented tools softwares languages have been developed which are being successfully used in marketing uh, throughout the world now that technology as i told you before can be incorporated into biological data as well that is very important right you see the uh, four v's volume velocity variety and veracity describes a big data but in biological data we have more than 10 v's approximately 10 v's isn't it so i would explain that by means of uh, whole exome sequencing data whole exome sequencing quite often called as wes what it tries to do is instead of sequencing uh, the entire genome it's possible that we can sequence protein coding genes alone that is what is called as the exome so it is much smaller than the genome right it's much much smaller than this normally Uh, it is from one percentage to ten percentage of the genome. That's all protein coding genes. But still, several meaningful conclusions can be derived from that. So you see, what we do is for a set of uh, uh, host of infectious diseases. See, uh, in, in one of the other talks, um, well, there was a question uh, about uh, uh, asymptomatic carriers. So asymptomatic carriers about typhoid, Mary, asymptomatic carriers and uh, COVID as well. Uh, so there were questions about that. So now you see uh, that could also be the alternate way of answering such uh, things is uh, uh, could could be by looking at the host genome, right? So f- identify factors in the host genome that contribute to this uh, asymptomatic nature of diseases. that could be done by means of uh, this wes sequencing right so you see here wes all right you have variety in it because of gender age ethnicity month when are you doing it month year organ tissue cell so there is variety there is veracity veracity is a validity all right veracity and then there is variability in it and the validity vulnerability it's vulnerable isn't it privacy security are often at risk so there is volatility as well there is volatility and then there is there is visualization more data you need to visualize that as well so there is visualization there is volume that is very important every single wes experiment at 100x coverage produces a play, uh, at least uh, 6 gb of data in bam form in binary format all right of course there is value but what i would like to see is there is volume there is velocity how much amount of data you get so you see every 5 minutes you can uh, a regular wes uh, regular genomics laboratory can produce one part- one sample can turn out one sample so every 5 minutes you are going to get 5 to 6 gb of data so that is the velo- velocity here so with all these things with all these things this qualifies as big data and big data other big data applications uh, software tools that has been successfully used by computer science people could be used here as well so this is what will be the future of genomics will be the future of biology in the coming years right so this is a very important uh, area that is developing in biology so big data analytics in biology call it big data biology mainly from ngs data it could be applied for infectious diseases as well so remember clearly as i told you before as i have showed you before that 
innovations and uh, discoveries in computer science have been consistently applied in biology now you have a revolution big data revolution in computer science that will be applied in biology as well so that is where we stand in the crucial uh, gen- uh, crucial uh, point of this uh, transfer so learning these big data analytics technologies as well as being a biologist would uh, would, would would help you for the next revolution uh, would help you to uh, find a solid place in the next revolution in biology all right so ngs and infectious diseases so you see uh, ngs methodologies you can do several applications in infectious combating infectious diseases microbiome analysis it will provide insight into microbial dysbiosis microbial community structure and role of microbes in health and diseases similarly you can do pathogenomics pathogenomics is gene gain you can you can you can uh, try to identify gene gain gene loss genome rearrangement mobile genetic elements etc that would lead us to uh, have some understanding about the pathogenesis of an organism similarly there could be omics approach which can identify novel uh, drug targets generate hypotheses uh, to predictive modeling right similarly host pathogen interaction could be identified resistor mapping could be done which can identify antibiotic resistant genes mechanisms that underlie uh, antibiotic uh, resistance the next important application in infect combating infectious diseases would be in diagnosis when we say ngs and sequencing it gives an impression that uh, it is going to take a lot of time but you see this case study reported is one of the very first uh, case studies which show using ngs for diagnosis it shows that uh, within a couple of days it's possible to do the diagnosis this case study is about a patient with uh, leptospirosis uh, but it uh, uh, identifying that the person has leptospirosis was difficult because there was a that happened to be a new strain and conventional recent blood techniques or conventional staining techniques uh, uh, was not positive for this particular patient so after hospitalization at day 42 uh, the clinicians decided that they can try give a shot at ngs uh, uh, ngs uh, data ngs uh, sequencing for identifying right for diagnosis so ngs library generation right so the timeline is in hours here in days here so you see for the second day they start doing this ngs experiment 44th day they finish it and uh, they get the data and by doing some preliminary phylogenetic analysis bioinformatics analysis on the data uh, it was identified that it was a new strain of leptospira sorry leptospira all right so that was beautiful you see within a period of two days uh, the patient Uh, uh, this is a patient's disease has been diagnosed uh, which was not possible by means of conventional techniques what you have to understand here what is remarkable here is the bioinformatics analysis took only how many minutes 97 minutes right they had a pipeline for that but uh, in short it took some 97 minutes everything else is experiment even this experiment could be automated since it's a uh, it was the first time it took so much of time so if it is being done regularly it's possible that it could be automated and the entire procedure could be over in one or one and a half days that's a very good um, time span for uh, uh, diagnosis right so that's a very interesting uh, case his case study which uh, shows us that ngs can also be successfully applied in diagnosis of uh, disease all right so having said all these things i would like to highlight a few works from Uh, our uh, group and our department where uh, some of our students did some interesting uh, uh, ngs data analysis the first work is by uh, mr m suresan who did mtech bioinformatics in sastra university what he did was he took uh, the rna seq data of uh, four different hepatitis uh, virus infected hosts all right so what he did was 
try to compare those four different hepatitis uh, viruses and he showed that there are by means of some statistical analysis basically uh, correspondent analysis determined correspondent analysis he was able to show that certain metabolic pathways are significantly differentially expressed or significantly different than uh, for each of the hepatitis viruses right so uh, the data of hepatitis c is shown here same uh, 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 type of uh, uh, data could be obtained by uh, for other hepatitis viruses as well so this was an interesting work which showed that even though it's hepatitis virus these four different viruses um, produces four different metabolic responses in the human host right the next work is also very interesting uh, work this is uh, this is done by our uh, btech bioinformatics students so they did this in their third year of uh, btech sundravalli and uh, sridharani what they did was they took rna seq data from public repositories and then they tried to show that a different drug responses and the corresponding uh, uh, gene expression pattern all right uh, different drug responses in gene expression so this uh, all this data was once again taken from uh, tcga uh, the cancer genome atlas cancer is not an infectious disease i know that but uh, the same methodology can be applied to infectious diseases as well so it's possible to do a transcriptomic profiling uh, as a response to different drug treatments and that has several uh, important applications what is important here what is notable here is that they did this by means of gathering data from public repositories and by using open source tools using r and some statistical uh, methodologies linear modeling etc so the this this type of maps are known as heat maps and uh, each one of these um, each one of these small uh, bars here represents a gene and the corresponding colors represent the amount of expression more uh, brown is positively highly positively uh, highly uh, upregulated gene and more uh, towards uh, white uh, down regulated gene you could clearly see that there are different so each small bar corresponding gene right so each of these genes are differently expressed when the patient is administered with different types of drugs so the drug response and the corresponding transcriptomic profiles could be registered by means of simple uh, computational experiments okay the next uh, uh, important uh, work very uh, impressive work uh, was done by uh, tamilini and srimathi tamilini does her mtech bioinformatics in sastra and srimathi btech bioinformatics in sastra they did this under the guidance of uh, dr suma mohan of uh, the bioinformatics department of sastra and what they did was they tried to take public uh, repository data gene expression data basically rna seq data of uh, host infected with sars cov2 right and they were able to identify by means of some meta analysis some important drug targets in the host that and then by means of those drug targets they were able to suggest some uh, drugs which could act as potential inhibitors for this uh, for this uh, drug targets so this is very uh, impressive because they did this uh, work entirely during the period of the lockdown right uh, so they started this work during the lockdown and they finished it and they were able to make a successful publication out of that so that is uh, remarkable because uh, they, they they were able to do all these things from public repositories and uh, mostly open source tools and uh, not by using very high fi computers but by using uh, their normal laptops and um, um, browsers and uh, open source servers to uh, do this work that is something uh, very remarkable all right so with that i would like to conclude my talk with a quote by uh, dr kalam all of us do not have equal talent but all of us have an equal opportunity to develop our talents 
this is entirely true for uh, for for uh, uh, biological data analysis and bioinformatics because most of the data that we have are in public repositories and most of the programs and tools that we use are uh, open source meaning they are free for use so you have the opportunity there are many many tutorials available there are many uh, online tutorials that uh, help us learn how to uh, how to how to use them to uh, do appropriate data analysis so we have an equal opportunity so it is the willingness for us to learn that uh, uh, that is what is required from from our side thank you very much